I'm getting feedback from people that I used to think neurodiversity was a bad thing or a burden or something that we shouldn't talk about. Now I think that it's something to celebrate and to embrace and that it's actually a good thing. And when we change those underlying beliefs and ways of being, the behaviors change as a result and it can sort of infiltrate all of the different systems. Hey friends, welcome to Right Off Track, your favorite entrepreneurial resource where we dive into the mindset, strategy, and purpose of entrepreneurs around the world who are sharing their real stories and insights with you. I believe that we all have a unique purpose in life and that embracing our unique and special journey will help uncover that. If this helps you on your journey, I so welcome your support as we grow and improve this channel. Join us, subscribe. I promise you I'm fully dedicated to making this work better every step of the way. So share your feedback, subscribe, share for a friend, and let's go on this adventure together right off track. Enjoy this episode. Going off track is taking a chance on yourself. Following your poles of curiosity. It's making your own decisions. The most wonderful adventure. Hey friends, I'm your host, Anya Smith. Get ready to be inspired by today's episode. We're exploring the cutting edge of inclusive work environments. Imagine a workplace tailored for every kind of mind where diversity isn't just welcome, it's the key to success. Our special guest today is at the forefront of this innovative approach, transforming how organizations attract and nurture top talent. From giving a powerful TEDx talk to her dynamic background in speech language, pathology, she's a force of creativity and insight. Stay tuned for an eye-opening conversation filled with practical wisdom and fresh perspective on leadership. Joining us today is the wonderful Megan Bond. Let's dive in. Thank you so much for having me. It is such a pleasure. It's a, such an important topic for us to discuss. And for everybody listening, can you start us off by explaining the concept of neurodiversity and why is it important in today's workplace? So I love to explain neurodiversity in a similar context to biodiversity in that all of the different minds are essential to be really flourishing and thriving in an environment. And it's the same idea when we have ecosystems and there's a wide variety of plants and animals, that's when they're thriving and flourishing. So it's really just this natural variation that happens. It's a good thing that we have lots of different types of brains with different ways that they think and feel and perceive and behave. And it's so important for organizations to really see and celebrate neurodiversity. It really helps them to accelerate innovation and have healthy teams that are viewing things from so many different lenses and viewpoints. And they really can capitalize on top talent when they're seeing differences in the strengths and the needs of people. And when they don't, they really risk losing amazing employees that could help their organization achieve its mission. Absolutely. And can you give us a little bit more perspective of what are some top challenges they see employers facing in this area? So it's really common to just have a lack of awareness and understanding. Many adults who may identify as neurodivergent, which would be not neurotypical, they may identify as autistic, ADHD, gifted, twice exceptional, dyslexic. There's, mm -hmm. It's a huge umbrella term for a lot of different identities. And many adults don't even know that they are neurodivergent and many are identified late. And so it's really important to be using the strategies to create inclusive environments that are really designed to the edges for all the different types of brains, whether an organization knows a person is neurodivergent or not. Absolutely. And for those organizations, because you mentioned there's a wide range of neuroplasticity and divergence, what can organizations start doing in terms of practical steps to account for this? So there's an approach that I love to describe using a story and it's called universal design. And one way to illustrate universal design is that the military had planes that didn't fit all the different sizes of pilots. 
And they kept asking for a solution to this problem. How can we have a wider variety of pilots be able to fly our planes? And they were told it can't be done, it can't be done. And lo and behold, how it was discovered was adjustable seats that we have in our cars today to be able to move forward and back and have different size people be able to fly a plane. And what we can do is we can make adjustable workplaces and adjustable learning environments for people because learning and development is really an essential part of a growing or organization. If people aren't learning and growing, then they're going to be disengaged. And what we did when I was an educational leader in terms of universal design for learning in the classroom is really think about how is the environment adjustable for the different types of learners, whether it's standing desks or wobble stools or uh, uh, working independently versus group work, things like that. We also looked at technology tools. Do some students write best using speech to text where they talk into their computer to write versus do some students read best by listening to a book versus reading a book or having it, the words highlighted. And so the same concepts that we really implemented in schools for all learners can also be applied to workplaces. And the best place to start is through what I call a GROW interview protocol. And it really has questions designed to uncover what an employee's strengths and needs are, to then think about how can we make the systems more adjustable, and that's really going to help everybody. Oh, beautiful. And can you dive us into this process? Because what I hear you saying could also apply to all employees, right? If we focus in on strengths, regardless of you know what employee knows and doesn't realize about themselves, it could give them a chance to shine. So can you guide us through this framework and who? how can it help everybody? So there's three different main components to the GROW interview protocol. And so the first section is really just asking and finding out more from the person. And it's really important to use the types of questions that are going to invite critical thinking, allow somebody to go deep and complex and really uncover information that they may not be able to share without being asked those types of questions. Then, and during that first step, it's really important for the person doing the interviewing to not try to do any problem solving or provide any solutions. So that whole first step in the interview is just listening, just curiosity, just empathy and really being able to sit in the feedback and the information and navigate through the emotions might, that may come up for that leader as they hear that person sharing and be able to just be with it and, and really hear them. Then step two, after the interview is complete, is the review process. Really going through that qualitative data and looking for themes and looking for strengths and what is going well and being able to be intentional about continuing to do the things that are supportive and building on that. And also identifying underlying unmet needs and how the systems and protocols in the company are impacting that person. And then the final step would be to plan and really make a plan that's reasonable and meaningful and gets to the root cause of the issue so that it's not surface level, trying to throw some different solutions out there, but that the plan is really developed collaboratively so that the person or the people who have given the information through the GROW interview are part of that problem solving and planning process where they're sharing possible solutions and working together to find something that's mutually agreeable.
because it really needs to be win-win so that the organization can continue to move forward with their mission and the employee's needs are met. And having this kind of protocol and system in place really helps everybody. When an organization has goals in place, they may not be able to stay focused on those and achieve them. But if they have systems in place that really gather this kind of information and figure out ways that are actionable to respond, it really builds it into the culture through the routines and systems. And so it creates a place where everybody's sharing what's going well for them and what their needs are and really normalizes that. Such a beautiful example. And again, if I'm hearing correctly, every employee could be part of this framework, right? Yes. Not just people who identify this way, but everyone could be yes, part of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so sometimes it's important to start with neurodivergent people as the first people who are really giving the input, because when we design to the edges for people who may have more asynchronous development, and by that I mean their strengths are really strong strengths and there can be big gaps in what they're really yeah. good at with what things they need supports with. And so those can be really impactful people to start with mm -hmm. because we're really expanding our environments to be inclusive to the edges. And that's gonna really bring in um, supports that help everybody. And I can imagine this could also be a sensitive topic Right. Do you have any advice for companies who may be fearful? Like, am I going to say the wrong thing? Am I going to uh, imp impose on somebody's personal, you know, you know, um, things that maybe they don't feel comfortable sharing? How do we do this in a way that's appropriate, that's empowering? And then, as you mentioned, create a system. So it's not just like, a, oh, this would be nice. And we're having this conversation and then nothing happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if you do the information gathering and then don't respond, that can lose trust. And so you want to be really prepared to be able to take some action steps from that information. But that's really common and normal to feel fear around talking about, talking about topics that revolve around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And there's been situations where people are canceled or they are treated in a way that they're just horrible for making this mistake. And it's really important to model that I'm open to learning. I'm open to trying something new and being a listener. And I might make mistakes and that's okay because we can create a culture at our organization where mistakes happen and we can repair. And that's healthy and that's normal to happen. Absolutely. And what about the systems? Do you have any advice about practically how to create systems? So once the feedback is gathered, what systems can people have so it's reasonable, so the reasonable accommodations are made and they're maintained? Yeah, absolutely. So once the information is gathered, it's really about having the systems to review the feedback and then the collaborative problem solving process. And so when those are in place and there's protocols to really invite solutions and look at trends of data, then you can come up with, well, we have this menu of accommodations or menus of adjustments that we can make. And many organizations already have a lot of accommodations and supports available, and it just isn't structures, structured in a way that really lays it out for people to show what is available. And then as things come up, those can be added and tweaked and adjusted so that people who may not know exactly what are the options that are available for me, what supports are even possible. I've never been asked this before. There's a system in place to refer to, well, people in the past have done this, this is what we offer. So in, I'm imagining our listeners, they could be, you know, leaders, founders, entrepreneurs, maybe some of them are in a corporate setting. What advice would you give them? Or like, how would you share the upside of investing in this kind of process? So there can be huge gains from having that healthy culture 
that's really inclusive of a wide variety of minds, you're really accessing unique strengths from different people and bringing in a wide range of diverse thinkers who can innovate and collaborate. You're engaging people so that they're really functioning at their potential. And when you have disengaged employees or there's high turnover, there are huge costs to that, both in time and money for rehiring, retraining, reestablishing culture. You've lost knowledge and all that on the job training you've done. And so oftentimes people don't realize some of the simple things that can be done to really uncover why an employee is disengaged or why people are quitting and that they're dealing with the repercussions of high turnover. And is it accurate to say that there's more presence of neurodivergence in society? So a lot of the estimates are around 15 to 20% of people would fall mm -hmm. under that umbrella term of neurodivergent, which includes so mm -hmm. many different identities. And the definition of neurodivergent is really thinks and perceives and feels and possibly behaves different than what's considered typical or common in a culture. And so as a culture shifts and changes, then who is considered neurodivergent may shift with that. Absolutely. And I think as, as we become, as cultures become, sorry, let me backtrack. As somebody who wasn't in corporate culture, I saw just how important this this inclusive environment was and is, especially I think now that there's such a high competition for talent, having a culture that thinks about the strengths of its employees and make sure that, you know, as best as possible, they support those strengths is very alluring because there's a lot of people have a lot of options. They can go to a lot of places. There's more remote options. So being seen as a company who not only in their words, but in actions creates a system for that um, is very um, enticing, I think, from all sides of the process. And I'm curious, for somebody listening to this, maybe like, I don't know, maybe I could be falling into that category. I have a sense that I'm slightly different, but I've never been tested. I've never been formally identified that way. What advice would you give to them? So first of all, you don't have to be formally identified to identify as neurodivergent. It's really common for adults to not have uh, gotten identified just, just because the educational systems are more likely to identify students now. And the tests are biased for adults. It's easier to identify kids. Adults have learned ways to mask and hide their traits and compensate. And so it doesn't always show up even if you do go get evaluated. And evaluations aren't accessible to everyone. It can be hard to get it and does take a lot of time and money. So the reality is, if you think you may be wired differently and neurodivergent, then do some research and do some learning. There are so many leaders and groups out there for people to take quizzes and learn about the traits and find their tribe. And even if you don't know exactly what identity you might fall under, you can just identify as neurodivergent. I feel like I'm, I'm different than, than what's typical and I think and perceive differently. And that's okay if that's something that you need. And it's important to acknowledge because neurodivergent people are marginalized. They're a population whose needs haven't always been met and they haven't always been celebrated for their differences. And once you kind of find your tribe and feel that empowerment to see your differences as strengths rather than a deficit and something that needs to be fixed or changed, it's so empowering and so helpful and you can be a role model for others to really be your authentic self and ask for what you need. And that's really a leader who is doing the, that kind of work to, to celebrate their strengths and ask for what they need. I love that. You know, what it reminds me of is that when I was in corporate, I definitely had the sense like I need to change myself to be successful or to grow. And what I realized in stepping out of that space is that really 
focusing on what brings me to life, like showing my authentic self is really making me a better leader, making me actually more successful. And I thought that it was going to be the opposite. I was devaluing some of the things that are uniquely mine. I wanted to tone myself down and whatnot. And now I realize those are really my strengths, no matter where I go. Sometimes when we dare to fully be ourselves and embrace our strengths and embrace the things that are different about us, mm -hmm. we truly, we feel different for A, like we start to feel different we show up differently. And we, to your point, we give other people permission to be themselves. And so if you leave with nothing else, realize that you have unique strengths, you do things differently. And that's great. Like the world doesn't need one kind of person doing things the same way. Your unique strengths are going to help the world in its unique way. So embrace that potential. And of course, Megan, how the heck did you get into this space? So I always wanted to be a teacher. I started a school in my basement when I was 10 years old and would love to brainstorm and plan all the activities for the kids, arts and cooking and outside time, all those things. My best friend and I did it together. And then I decided to become a speech language pathologist and work in the schools once I graduated with my psychology degree. And I was interested in education, but just doing it in a different way. And I really realized that what needed to happen was the systems in the schools needed to change. The students that I was working with were absolutely amazing. They had amazing strengths. They learned differently. They weren't always successful in the classroom with the current systems. And I really focused my services on supporting, making the environments adjustable so that they could really learn and grow um, and be themselves. I became a leader and did a lot of trainings for educators and leaders and parents and led a lot of systems change around climate and culture and inclusion at both the school and district level. And I really realized that that was the way that we needed to create these inclusive environments so every student could thrive and just became a learning expert. Then my kids got identified neurodivergent and I realized that the traits that got them identified really were similar to how I am. And so I decided to get identified and get an evaluation for myself. And I realized at the school that I was working at that my needs weren't being met and that I wasn't being my full self at work. And I decided that I needed to make a change to really be able to thrive and have the energy and have the impact that I wanted to have. And so that's what led me to shift to entrepreneurship. And I just am so passionate about bringing my expertise in inclusive learning and development to all organizations, not just schools, because it's really the same principles in any learning environment. And I think it's so important to cross pollinate the ideas around special education and gifted education and learning in general for all students and bring that to work. There's a cliff that happens after high school or college for neurodivergent students that their needs are not met in the workplace when they had these types of different supports and adjustable environments in schools. And we need to transition them into workplaces that help them really thrive. Oh, beautiful. I'm so grateful to hear that story of, you know, it evolving and you had this curiosity and then this purpose and it evolved and it really snowballed into you seeing yourself in it and identifying that way. I'm curious, you identified yourself, you self-identified yourself through this process. Could you share with us what was the biggest challenge you had to overcome to create a structure for your own success as an entrepreneur? So one of the biggest areas of learning for me has been around money. I was in an environment in public education where we were being paid significantly less than similarly educated professionals. I had a bachelor's degree, a master's degree in speech language pathology, and an educational specialist degree in educational leadership and a principal license. 
And I was still making significantly less than my partner who was working in corporate. And to shift to business and just have this heart that I want to give and change the world and be accessible to everybody, it wasn't a sustainable business model for me. And so I had to understand what were the underlying beliefs that I had about receiving money and what value I'm bringing to companies to be able to grow and provide a premium service to corporations. In terms of then, you mentioned that you self-identified as neuro um, divergent a little later on in life. Did that process make you change the way you do work? Was that realization helping you do things differently so you can be more successful? Yes. So I give myself a lot more rest time and longer sections of deep work where I can think in complex ways and brainstorm and have certain days where I have meetings and I am interacting with others. I really am able to build in time in nature and be able to go for a walk and get some fresh air. I set up supports for myself in terms of what I need for learning. So I have coaches and group learning where I have professional learning communities of people who are in a similar place and need the similar types of learning at a similar pace that I do in a similar way where I'm a verbal processor. And so I meet all of those needs for myself that I had asked for some of those things when I was working for in public education and they weren't all available to me. I love that. I love the process of self-discovery and that you identified what works for you and then you sought it out. Mm -hmm. right? And here you are now leading in the space and helping others. And to as much you know detail as you can share, can you share with us maybe a transformation that happened with an organization or a purpose that you worked with where through your guidance, they saw some change? So even just in the workshops that I do to give the foundational principles about neurodiversity, I'm getting feedback from people that I used to think neurodiversity was a bad thing or a burden or something that we shouldn't talk about. Now I think that it's something to celebrate and to embrace and that it's actually a good thing. And when we change those underlying beliefs and ways of being, the behaviors change as a result and it can sort of infiltrate all of the different systems. So it's really exciting for me even though we focus on putting together actionable strategies and next steps of the, those behaviors that you can actually see, um, getting the feedback from people about their belief changes and just how they, they approach the topic. That's beautiful. And thinking about it from two sides, maybe you can start whichever side you prefer. So say there's an employer and they obviously maybe have not asked these questions of their employees. Uh, they're not asking. How can they start having those conversations in a way that feels open and respective? And then on the other side, if you are an employee and you identify that this is something that aligns to your life, how can you start having those conversations with people around you in your workplace? So I always think start with a strength-based approach. And so asking about what is going well. When are the times when you feel just lit up? Which parts of the project have you felt energized by? Mm. What are you most proud of? That's not scary to ask somebody mm. those types of questions to really get to know them at the detail level of what is going well and be able to take that information and think about how can we replicate these opportunities for this person. And then the same thing for the employee to share those with somebody. When I got a chance to work on this project this way, that helped me so much. That energized me so much. I loved it. When we did this in a meeting, that was so helpful to me. I loved getting think time after a question before we ran around and shared our responses. I loved having 
uh, get to know you relationship building opportunity at the beginning of the meeting, or it really helped me to have notes written down to be able to review what the action steps were and, mm -hmm. and visually see them. And so noticing what's going well is always going to build relationship, build trust to then be able to have those conversations when a need is not being met or to be ready to receive the feedback of how can we improve? What are some next steps that would support you to thrive even more? I love that. And I could also see there being a way to start the conversation in even anonymous way saying, hey, we want to maybe have uh, brand information or education with you say, hey, this is, you know, this is what we value. If you ha want to have this conversation without identifying anybody even in mind, like reach out to HRBP or your manager, here's just an opening of the conversation, inviting people to self-select to be part of this. So it doesn't have to be something that feels like, hey, do you identify? You mm -hmm. like, hey, this is important to us. Just we value this. Um, if you ever want to, you know, share this with your manager, HRBP, here's how to do that. So create that space for people to come in and participate as and when they are ready. Absolutely. And I'm seeing a lot of companies starting to do more affinity groups mm -hmm. for different populations of people where they can connect with other people who identify in a similar way. And having a neurodiversity affinity group is a great way to have people self-select as wanting to talk about something and being able to have, be able to share feedback sort of as a group. So it's a little more anonymous than an individual person. Absolutely. And can you share with us also, what kind of resources can people find? Like, so this is a really interesting topic and I can imagine it can feel overwhelming. Do you have any recommendations for people again on the employer and maybe the individual side uh, where to find resources around this? So one really exciting resource that we have in Colorado is called the Neurodiversity Chamber of Commerce. And it's an organization dedicated to just celebrating neurodiversity in the workplace. And there's big businesses that are really excited about this work that are joining and supporting the movement and momentum of celebrating neurodiversity in the workplace. So that's a great place to look. And then there's a lot of organizations and consultants that are doing inclusion work. Even if you wanted to focus on the hiring process, mm -hmm. there's websites and organizations who are attracting neurodivergent employees and helping mm -hmm. match them based on what employers need. And then mm -hmm. offer, offering different types of training to make sure that company is ready for someone who may look different that may not have been hired through a traditional hiring approach uh, to mm -hmm. be able to really leverage their strengths. So that's a great way to attract people and mm -hmm. just reaching out to the different myriad of consultants who are doing the work. I love that. I love to see this growing effort happening, the normalization of different skill sets, different ways people think, and that we can come together instead of stigmatizing something, we see the opportunity, we challenge ourselves to see the growth potential, and that makes everything better. And I also wonder, we're both moms, and you mentioned that your children also got identified, and that kind of led to this evolution. How has your parenting changed? Or like, what kind of advice would you give to other parents who have found their children are uh, identified on this? So I use the same approach as the GROW interview protocol with my kids all of the time. It's just built into me. And I'm constantly asking them questions and being a listener and really digging deep to empathize with their experience and what's going on. And then reviewing the information before I jump to solutions and thinking about what are the underlying strengths? What are the underlying needs? What's underneath this? And now I'm going to invite you to collaboratively problem solve with me so that you can learn the problem solving process of advocating for your own needs, understanding that I have needs and our family has needs and we need to come to mutually agreeable solutions to the challenges that come up. And I really see them becoming self-advocates and 
seeing that their differences are not something that's a problem or broken about them, but that we celebrate their differences and we see that you might be more highly sensitive in this area or you need extra rest, you need less time doing this or support with this and that's okay. And taking that approach, it can be as a parent in a company, in a relationship, any anywhere. I, I love that you're training that. I can see that being applicable to every aspect of your life, you know, professionally, personally. It also reminds me, on this journey as an entrepreneur, you have to get really honest with yourself because there's nobody else to blame or say like, oh, they're causing me to do this, 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 and this, and this. And I realized I had the cycle of always doing, doing, doing. And then I had a realization that I don't perform best. Shockingly, after decades, <laughs> finally I was like, hey, I need to slow down. Like the S word, slow down. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just important. So to your point, like identifying what my strengths are and that what I was doing, like that I was giving myself a ba- like this badge of honor for how much stress I could sustain that like if I could feel that shake and squeezing in my body because it's like how much further can I push myself um and then I was like that wasn't working for me like this is a it's it's not about seeing how much of a martyr you can be about sustaining stress it's about like that's probably a sign you should look a different way um and so if you're looking so no matter where you are just listen to yourself how do you work how can you advocate for your strengths and as, just as opposed to like seeing if somebody's doing it and seems like everybody can if you see other people working a lot and handling stress that doesn't mean that it's actually beneficial to them that doesn't mean that this grind that we so unquote like glamorize is healthy for anybody so and they're probably also internally not excited about this process so find how you perform best realize does this actually energize you or does it deplete you and where can you self uh self sustaining yourself, how do you recover from that in a unique way and advocate for those things? Because working to grind all your life is not the solution. It's not going to lead you to good places. So if you're there and you like, you feel so proud of that, I would question like, is that really serving you? Yeah. And, and I would say that's one of my top parenting strategies as well is modeling. Mm -hmm. What do I want them to do and see me do? I'm going to ask for my needs. I'm going to rest. I'm going to do what Mm -hmm. lights me up and energizes me. So I love that. Absolutely. Because as much as we can tell them, like, don't do this or do this, ultimately, not just our kids, people around us are going to see what actions we take much more than what we say. And so it's very important that, again, we're showing up as, as, examples to our children um, of what a healthy work life, you know, priority balance can look like. And we're showing people around us, you know, so many people, I know probably people that you work with that you don't know are watching and they reach out like, Hey, I am so impressed or, or, Hey, I learned this because you don't know who's watching, but they're following your example mm-hmm. and priority and giving you permission to go a different way. So I love that. And again, we talked about so much. I love this. Can you dive a little bit more about your work? What resources, services do you offer? How could people work with you? Yeah. So I offer a couple of different resources. The first thing is my private podcast mini series, and that's at growtoptalent.com. And uh, it walks people through how to do the grow interview protocol so that they can do it either with an employee or they can just go through it on themselves and reflect on their own Uh, questions and think about how they could apply it as a parent in many areas of their life. And then I also offer services where I review learning and development systems. Mm -hmm. And we really look at how is the learning adjustable and inclusive. We look Mm -hmm. for strengths at an organization. Mm -hmm. And learning happens in training programs, in weekly meetings, in coaching systems, onboarding. So any of those types of learning and development systems, we can review and take a deep dive to really notice what Mm -hmm. is going well and some next steps to really ensure everybody's thriving at work and Mm -hmm. come up with a plan together that you can either choose to implement on your own 
when you're done going over it with me, or you can partner with me to implement it together and get support. Oh, that sounds amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. And here at Right Off Track, we wrap up three rapid fire questions. So whenever you're ready, let me know. Let's do it. Let's do it. I love it. Okay. Uh, first one, what's the most common misconception about neurodivergent, excuse me, what's the most common misconception about neurodivergent individuals in a professional setting? That they are full of areas of deficit, that mm. the person is going to be a significant challenge to support, that it's going to take so many resources, be a liability on the company, that mm. I would only hire a neurodivergent person because it's the good or right thing to do rather than mm. it actually helps my company. And nobody mm. would have known that I was neurodivergent. I was a high achieving a uh, leader that was well respected in the organization. And so uh, people just don't realize that it really is top talent that is going to bring a lot of strengths and important things to help your organization. Oh, thank you. Such an such important clarification. Okay. Two, can you name a leader who embodies inclusivity in the workplace? I love Brene Brown's approach where she really walks the walk and doesn't just talk the talk because she mm -hmm. talks about how with her employees at her organization, they have systems in place to give everybody think time in a meeting and jot something down on a sticky note and put it in the middle of the table and be able to rumble over differences and that is inclusion and, and talking about listening to people and validating their emotions. That's an inclusive leader. Oh, beautiful. Okay. Last but not least, in the positive sense, going off track is? Creating a path that hasn't been created before to mm -hmm. go on an adventure and make something really new and special. Thank you. I mean, this was a blast. Thank you so much. I knew this was going to be a very important topic. I appreciate you empowering all of our listeners, wherever they're in their journey, sharing some ways that we can all be more inclusive, where we can have strategies that not only listen to everybody, but also then create something that gives them the, the space to succeed and perform at their best, whatever their individual needs are. Uh, Megan, it was such a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming right off track of us. And do you have any final words before I let everybody go? Neurodiversity is as critical for our communities as biodiversity. Beautiful. And there you have it. Thank you to all our listeners for checking in. Thank you so much for learning with us. Share with us your feedback. What stood out to you? If you have a friend who might be benefiting from this message, share it with them as well. And as always, I'm so grateful for your support, grateful for your comments, and let's take over the world together right off track. Until next time. Take care, Megan. Thank you.